Hey now, cats, we're back again this week, and it's been a long time since we've seen you. Hi. You might not recognize us. You mm -hmm. might not recognize where we're at. A lot has been happening. You might, a lot. You might not recognize this beautiful mug. Nah. <laughs> Ex Tina. Ex Tina, that's me. Let's give this uh, audience a little refresher about what we're about and where the hell have we been at? Well, I'm Ex Tina. He's balls. We, uh, well, I was going to say, you know, well, we're married uh, because, you know, that happened. That's part of where we've been. Mm -hmm. uh, got married back in October in uh, the cemetery where uh, the original Night of the Living Dead was filmed in Evan City. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, let's see here. What else happened? Oh, we bought a house. A little house here. Yeah, that's what's going on behind us. Hello. A little house, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and let's see, uh, you know, we've just been, uh, working our butts off and, um, had a bout of COVID busy and COVID. Oh yeah, we did have a bout of COVID. Holy cow. Holy cow. I forgot about that. You know, a little, a little thing called COVID. You know, just had that death virus for a while. That's all. Yeah. You know, and then, uh, you know, here we are. We so. survived. We made it through. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. We regrouped. We're back. And we're going to be better than ever. So Absolutely. let's get right into it. We have an incredible guest this week, X Tina. Would you mind telling the audience who we have this week? Mm. Mm. The one, the only, Shuley. You may know him. You Where might, would they you know might, him? You might have might seen him before. Uh, he, he was on a little, uh, I don't know, the greatest show on earth, the Howard Stern Show. Uh, people might know him from that. Uh, people might know him from his appearances from the Jay Thomas Show. Uh, He's on uh, the Howard 100 News Team. Uh, in fact, he's a well-known stand-up comedian, uh, producer, and now the host of his own show, The Shuley Show, which you can find on Herdat, on Patreon, and uh, YouTube. And uh, I'm going to be having my long-overdue interview with Mr. Egar, and uh, that came out wonderful. I can't wait for you cats to see that. But before we get to that, we got a couple little things to talk about here. Uh, X Tina, would you like to kick it off? Well, what would we like to talk about, Balls? We like I don't to... know. What's our show about? Well, it's about horror stuff, horror news, horror movies, things we've seen, things we've watched, places we've been, which haven't really been any place because of uh, COVID. Not really. But, you know, things are changing. Things are looking up. We got a drive-in coming up this weekend. We do, and we're gonna actually be uh, hopefully chatting with the amazing Felissa Rose. We're gonna be going to see Sleepaway Camp, the classic Sleepaway Camp on the big screen, and Slumber Party Massacre at Vandergriff Drive-in, and uh, it's the Riverside Drive-in this weekend. Uh, they have the April Ghouls weekend all weekend <laughs> long. So if you live close or within driving distance, cats, I. Highly recommend going down to there and checking that out. That's always a good time. Absolutely. Uh, other than that, I mean, I've been I've been reading a lot of weird stuff lately, X Tina. Things that puzzle me, things mm. that I want to share with the audience that I think are cool. But I think uh, I'm just going to get right into the first one here. I wanted to throw this off you. I got a piece of really weird news I was reading today, and I just mm. thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, have you read about Purple Urkel? Hmm. I don't know what a purple orca is, no. Well, uh, we've actually met the dude before. He's actually very nice. Oh. Uh, do you remember Jaleel actual, White actual from Urkel. Family Matters? Did actual you? Urkel. <laughs> Did I do that? You want a piece of cheese, Laura? Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, anyway, that Urkel is coming out with his own line of weed. Whoa, what? Yeah, I'm not kidding. And it's called Purple Urkel. And there's an ad out I've seen today where he's decked out just like Urkel, plugging his weed and Snoop Dogg's in the back, like, fucking hanging out with him, smoking purple oh Urkel. Oh, my God. This you got to see it. If I could get a still, I'll throw it up for you guys. Hey, but, and it's uh, 420. No and it, exactly. It's 420. For what a good uh, story for 420, right? Yeah. I don't even do that, but I, I feel like I want purple Urkel. <laughs> I sort of feel like I can, you know, I don't, you know, I quit smoking years ago. I quit smoking weed years ago. I sort of feel like I could, if Purple Oracle had some edibles, I think I could probably uh, mm. hang with some Purple Oracle. You Absolutely. know, not that I need a reason to get fatter, but uh, mm. Purple Oracle sounds kind of nice right now. Seems After a, I could see having a rough day at work, and man, I gotta go home and curl up with a nice uh, Purple, purple Oracle. Take me away. I mean, it, it, it's it, the new cow gone. It really is. <laughs> but moving right along, I'll talk to you about something that I'm absolutely not excited about. 
something that I think is a really, really terrible idea. And something that uh, is, I mean, I, I, I've loved this dude since the beginning. Uh, some of his music is among some of my favorite albums ever made. Uh, I actually even got into an uh, internet war with him once, and it was really <laughs> odd because I was complimenting the dude, and he took it the wrong way and completely told me to fuck off. But uh, And who might this be, dear? It is the one, the only, Rob Zombie. But today I'm going to say some shit that will warrant him to tell me to fuck off. <laughs> because I heard the stupidest and the worst idea that I've ever heard today. Well, actually, a couple days ago. Mm-hmm. For the Peacock Network, which is NBC, I mean, Rob Zombie is going to reboot the Monsters and do a movie. And I know people that are Rob Zombie fans are probably like, yay, that's fucking awesome. People that are Munsters fans, I mean, I, he, I, I have no doubt I've heard before from, you know, on the, on the Howard Stern show that he's a humongous fan. He loves it, loves the source material. Mm. I don't even care who would do it. I just think it's not a good idea, period. Right. And I, I, I just, I can't believe that he's going to do that and not put that, like, white trashy profane Mm -hmm. twist on it and that's Mm -hmm. just everything that that's not about right like i mean i i I mean i can when i hear rob zombies monsters i hear uh you know herman monster coming hey you motherfucker they're like like, lily i'm gonna suck your cunt yeah it's just gonna be like that shit like and it's gonna be terrible like i can't believe that he would ever be able to do a restrained yeah you know, uh, reboot of the monsters, and even if he, I mean, mm-hmm. even if he did, I mean, it's not even just you, Rob Zombie. It's just a terrible idea, period. So yeah. that'd be like somebody like, uh, you know, remaking uh, the Wizard of Oz or, or something right. like that. You just and don't I, they've touch tried, it. and that's been shitty too. Some things so. you don't touch. Yeah, I mean, how do you feel about it? Do you think I'm right? I, mean, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely. Uh, right. I couldn't think of a worse dude to try to do that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and, I, and I like the dude. I do. Yeah. But uh, and that doesn't mean, you know, I, I, that's not good in anyone's hands. So. Uh, yeah. Terrible idea. Please don't rob zombie. Please reconsider. Well, just, ugh. Anywho. Anywho. I'll tell you something else that I thought was, that kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. I was super excited. I even voted in, the fa- in Fango earlier this year for the Chainsaw Awards. And this is the first year they broadcast them on Shudder, you know, a channel which I've talked about endlessly and I support and I love. Uh, uh, talk mm-hmm. about a disappointing show. Mm-hmm. I was super excited for it and, like, I've never felt more, like, pandered to as an audience. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I as a fan, like, I don't really like to be, like, you know, I almost feel like, you know, right, they, they focus more on, like, dumb shit than an award show. Yeah. Like, whenever, you know, whenever I want to watch an award show, I want to see shit that pertains to an award, you know? like Right, or people with, um, you know, some knowledge of the horror industry, and that's what you would expect on Shudder, yeah, you know? Yeah, exactly. And Fangoria. The, and this was, like, an hour-long show to begin with, which is very short. Mm-hmm. And 40 minutes, you know, out of an hour was probably, if that, uh, the awards. In fact, it's probably... probably lesser than that and there's just uh, i don't know why like they think that like if you like horror movies that like you, you like, they, they have these dumb cheesy cheesy characters and, and, and then like and, and skits and th- there's some lady on there that doesn't even like pertain to anything at all she had a what 10 minute long music she has, like, video? a 10 minute long music video it's not even really horror all i could think of is like this lady is so untalented and, 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 but, and I'm like thinking maybe uh, this must be a relative of somebody that owns yeah. Fango now because how the fuck did they spend 10 minutes out of an hour long award show on this lady and I don't even want to tell you the name because I know she already has a humongous amount of views which blows my Jeez. fucking mind and it's because of garbage like this like them shows and awards yeah. and I'm like here's us busting our ass to get like 100 views <laughs> if we're lucky right and this idiot that has no Ten, no, no, no talent whatsoever has like a million views, right? And it, it, it's because like because they pander sure. to like the horror movie crowd, you right. know. And like it, it was just, I could watch it shake my head. And, mm-hmm. I mean, I love uh, Lee Wannell. 
the, the uh, Invisible Man. I was going to say, let's talk about that. But they might as well just call it the Lee Wannell Show. Like, mm. there's so many indie people that really pushed the envelope in horror last year mm -hmm. and, and really used the pandemic as a revolutionary tool to mm -hmm. to make things that are different and, and, and like a mirror to what they're feeling right. and, and their emotions being, you know, trapped and pent up in, right. in, in a pandemic. And we've seen some incredible films last year because of it. And I mean, I I, I love the dude. I, I, I think he's did lots of great stuff, but... I, I really think The Invisible Man was kind of overhyped, man. Absolutely. They showed everything that was really cool in the trailer. Mm -hmm. It's almost two hours long. It goes, it's really slow. To me, it was very disappointing. When Whenever, you know, there's some good stuff in it. I, I don't mm -hmm. think it's and the I, worst I, film. I love Elizabeth Moss, shout out. But I think it's definitely one of the most overhyped films of that year. Mm -hmm. and, For sure. Uh, you've seen little films that got overlooked because of it. Because they pretty much swept the whole night. It was like it reminded me of the Oscars and how right, silly and the Oscars got. You know, and on I mean, a shot, on a format like Shutter and with Bangoria, you think they would be like more inclined to, to support not, the little guy. But yeah, again, I mean, it was voted on by fans. So that's the surprising fans? thing, man. <laughs> like I almost wonder that like so many little people vote now that like uh, yeah. yeah. But I, I the whole thing this year was very puzzling to me. Like mm -hmm. as a as a fan, I felt very catered, you know, pandered to and marketed to, and like yeah. I don't really, I don't like that feeling. Like I, uh, I, li I like seeing indie people get, uh, you know, some accol you know, accolades deserve. and what yeah. they deserve, and sure. I don't really feel like there was much of that. And you know, they touted all these big mm -hmm. celebrities and things and stars, mm -hmm. and I didn't think there was very many. I mean, uh, Kevin Smith and uh, you know, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah, they. Yeah, that was yeah. interesting. Other they than that, presented, but other than that. There was a bunch of nobodies. Yeah, I'm like, uh, I'm like. Any, Although, uh, what do you expect from the Chainsaw Awards? But still. I mean, be, be honest with you, in the past, uh, they were pretty cool. I mean, uh, yeah. They, uh, so yeah, I don't know. That was kind of disappointing. Yeah, uh, so. I'll tell you what's not disappointing. I'm super excited. I got to see the new clip. I'm sure she's probably sick of seeing it, but I've replayed it seven million times. <laughs> I know where this is going. I uh, they finally dropped the. You know, little clip from Ghostbusters Afterlife, and uh, well, yeah, I had a big boner with a cheeseburger on the end. That's all I'm going to tell you. Uh, Hashtag nerd. No, oh, big time. So I, I, I couldn't be more happy. The more I read, Ernie Hudson just seen it in private on the Sony lot, and oh, wow. he was, oh, he was amazed. Nice. When you have Bill Murray saying it's the closest thing to the original, it's in the wow, same vein. That's great. That's a dude that kept this movie from happening for 30 years. Right. So uh, my anticipation couldn't be more. Uh, and, and, you know, and something else, uh, when I was a kid, uh, they had Ghostbuster cereal. And in light of this new movie coming out, guess what they brought to back out, kids? This guy called like five different stores over the weekend. Hi, do you have Ghostbuster cereal? And they're like, huh? What? Like, Hello. And I'm in the background. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like, Hello, store clerk. This is yeah, the nerd that wants Ghostbusters cereal. My name is Boss. You wouldn't happen to know if you cereal. have any. And they're all like, whatever, dude. And she's <laughs> in the background. Ha <laughs> ha, 44-year-old man with Ghostbuster cereal. <laughs> and I got it. No, that's right. So you fuck did. you. You got seven boxes. <laughs> I got five know. boxes. Okay, well. well I should have got seven boxes. <laughs> but anywho. Uh, you're, you know, boy, that's the most unkept secret in, in history. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a fucking <laughs> nerd, nerd. So, yeah. Also, May fourteenth, Saw Spiral was finally coming out. The Book of Saw. Ooh. That's the that's the Saw movie that was pitched, wrote, created, and I do believe partially directed by Chris Rock, the comedian. That's amazing. And I can't, this, I can't wait just this, for that alone. This, they have so much faith that this movie is going to re-jump the Star, Star franchise. The next one's already greenlit. Wow. That's how sure they are that people are going to dig this movie. Wow. Seeing two different trailers, I think good. I'm going to dig this movie. Mm -hmm. It looks really good. And I, it's funny because sometimes comedians can really, you know, do a good job at the horror show. I look mm -hmm. at... Uh, Hall, the last Halloween. Jordan Peele. Too. Oh, that's a good. That's a good point. Yeah. He's a, he's a comedian, and look at cheese. He's been a powerhouse since he's uh, mm -hmm. since Get Out, uh, since Us. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I mean, that just goes to show you. Sometimes kind of, they say comedians are damaged people mm -hmm. or dark people, but I think that's why they could tap in and make decent horror. So mm -hmm. I mean, 
Excited for that. Excited for Neo Costa's uh, Candyman. That's coming out this year finally. It's gonna. It seems like everything's starting to kind of slowly, at least take yeah. a direction of normal. Sort of. I'll be excited to see all these things coming out. Uh, Absolutely. I'll tell you something I was super excited for that I loved, and if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend it. Not so sure about Xtina. She's not really into it. Uh, Godzilla versus King Kong. This film, during a pandemic, mind you, has made $400 million globally. Wow. And that's with hardly any movie theaters even open. Wow. So. That's amazing. I have to say, I didn't sit and watch it because it's just sort of not my thing, but uh, the, the visuals alone are mind-bogglingly incredible, so. I couldn't be happier. Uh, it was what I'm looking for. I thought the last couple... Uh, you know, Godzilla movies kind of blue. So uh, this was what I was looking for. If you want to see a big, dumb monster fight, you want to turn your brain off and have a great time, you got to check it out, which I'm sure most of you already have anyway. This weekend, Mortal Kombat. Super excited for that. Uh, uh, oh, Showtime. One of my favorite films uh, of all time is uh, a little foreign film, a little vampire film called Let the Right One In. Uh I think it's a five-star movie on every level. Uh, it has heart, it has emotion. It's uh, it can be creepy at times, but most of all, it's about like friendship and and and, and, and loss. And it's just an excellent film. Mm -hmm. I've heard for years that they're trying to the option to make a television series, and it's happened a few times and it's fell through. Showtime finally is going to bring us the Let the Right One in series. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, there ain't too much to know about it, and there's a couple cast members. But it's finally come to Showtime sometime next year. It's going to touch on the origin of uh, Ely. Um, she, when she finally gets a bit and she becomes a vampire and then she actually, you know, finds uh, her friend. So, I mean, that's uh, going to be cool. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Creep Show Season 2 has Ooh. been out. And they really set the bar high this year. The first episode, I think, might probably be my favorite episode of the whole series. Hmm. It's yeah. so, it, it was so, it was everything that a monster kid like me could want. A monster kid. <laughs> and, and, I, and I loved it. Like, it, 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 it was very emotional. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, I, and it just, it was the perfect episode. The, the, the last couple after that, I think they raised the bar so high for me that it's, they've been kind of hit or miss. But again, I'm super enjoying the whole series. I look forward to every Thursday now. Uh, I'm so happy that we have, we have it for another... I think they greenlit another season after that already. So nice. we have season three. Nice. Super excited about that. I got a couple more things before I hand it over to Xtina. Well, don't we have a, um, before you hop into music, I think that's where you're headed. Is that where you're headed? Music? That was where I was headed, Before yes. you head to music, I want to put a <laughs> on you because there's something you forgot. I forgot um, something? Uh, you forgot something. A show we've been watching Ooh. every night for the past probably week or so. And uh, yeah. it is... How could I forget that? How could you forget that? A little show called Them. Oh my gosh. Amazon Prime. Oh my gosh. I'm sure you heard about it. Quite controversial. Uh, very highly um, racially driven. Uh, very not for the, you know, uh, go into it. It's going to leave a bad taste in your mouth, whether you're black or white or anything. That's but what it's supposed to I do, know. though. It's supposed to get it's, you to think. It's Yeah, and I'll tell you what. If you have any racist inclinations, you better watch this because, like, you're a piece of shit <laughs> if, you're, if you do because this is nuts. I mean, it takes place in the 50s, and it follows this black family who leaves their southern area to go to California where they, you know, buy a house and the, the father's an engineer and, you know, they're trying to start a good, great life for their two daughters and um, they move into, ironically, of all things, Compton, which, as we now know, uh, is predominantly black and gang-ish and, you know, but it was a hoity-toity, richety-uppity, I guess upper-middle-class neighborhood with all these ignorant white people just like it goes day by day and shows like each day what these neighbors are willing to do to get this family out of their neighborhood. They haven't even taken a chance to get to know them, mind no. you. They're just basing just it the on the deterioration their... of yeah. you know, uh, 
I, I, and it's funny, man, because like I remember bloody disgusting a few months ago raving about this, and I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. I really want to. I kind of lost track of it. I seen it pop up the other day, and we ended up. I'm like, yeah, let's watch one of these and mm -hmm. see what we think. Yeah, We've been hooked yeah, ever right since. Away. I, you, you know, it's really eye opening, actually. I mean, as I don't, I don't know how you could watch this show with any sort of soul or heart and not have any empathy. Like how? Yeah. I, I mean, I could see watching the show. I, how black people can hate us? <laughs> I, I, I mean, oh yeah, uh, that's like, been like, very eye-opening too. Because I'm know, watching this and I'm like, I get it. Yeah. Like I get how that can happen, but I mean, that's not the answer. Obviously, everybody should. Right. I'm about balls is about unity. Balls is about everybody is equal, and right. uh, we should all come together and and just right. have a big old love fest. But right. uh, as much as I hate people, uh, I do feel that way. Right. Uh, but you, I mean, when you watch this and you just see this evil and hatred towards yeah. people for really no reason yeah uh, uh, and and i mean there's spooky stuff in it too yeah they keep yeah. it a little supernatural to keep you interested yeah, but but it's you know, but it's more i think the scariest part about this show is the human element is the human element yeah. it reminds me of scooby-doo because like scooby-doo when you were a kid did you ever hear a thing it's like scooby Two taught me that there's the only real monsters is fucking people right Exactly. And yeah, I always true. tell her, I rave endlessly. My One of my favorite Vincent Price movies is a movie called The Monster Club. And the reason why is, the whole thing's about monsters, but it's all about the ending. There's this Vincent Price, he's hosting this, you know, like, he's Vincent Price, and, you know, he's mm -hmm. hosting this dinner party with the world's scariest, creepiest monsters. Right. And they're all there, like, you know, boogieing and having a good time. And mm -hmm. he's like, you know, ha, 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 you know, like, but then they have this projector at the end. And, uh, they play the film, this film, and they're like, and now I want to pay a tribute to the biggest monster known to in the entire universe. And they're all like, yeah, you know, and it's like, this monster would, you know, not even bat an eyelash and kill uh, its fellow monsters. And, and and it just goes, and it would blow, it would, it's blown people up, uh, hundreds, you know, millions of people, more or less, it just has did everything evil that you could do in a society and all the monsters are like motherfucker holy shit you know they're all scared and they're like who the fuck is it they're all looking around like they, they, they're not here like who is it then they have a human walk out it's like everybody knows the biggest monster known in the world is man and then they're all like yeah they're all like fucking ready to shit their yeah. monster pants because yeah. like they see what a crazy motherfucker man is <laughs> and that's true like Mm -hmm. This this show will open your eye, your peepers this wide, and really make you think. Like, it really make you reevaluate, like how you, yeah. you know, how you think about people, man. Like, yeah, uh, and how silly and backwards and stupid racism really is. Absolutely. So, absolutely. And and and, and, it, and it does that, and it really sticks with you. Like, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I haven't seen a show. That, I mean, I've seen it all, and mm -hmm. I haven't seen a show like this that actually will get in there and unnerve you. And, and make you it's bitch really and make you think about it for days after yeah. you've finished watching it for real. and it's uh god damn is it a good show yeah. so I, I can't say anything better about it watch them uh, uh what's this crazy kooky thing you have on uh table <laughs> yeah before before we get to my last thing here uh balls I, I'm just not gonna. I'm gonna come out and say it. I am in love with Psycho Goreman, one of my favorite films of the year. I could go. I could write a thesis paper on why I love this movie so much. <laughs> you you so, probably could. I, I, but in a nutshell, I'll tell you why. I, I don't think I've got to talk about it since we've been gone. So real quickly, when I was a kid in the '80s, they had movies from Amblin. Like I mean, it brings me back to like, you know, family, you know, family like adventure kind of horror movies. And uh, like when I was a kid, I loved The Gate. The Gate's a scary fucking movie, but it's for it's a it's more or less a family horror movie, mm. and it's it works on every element. Mm -hmm. Like it's scary when it has to be, it's touching when it has to be, and it's funny when it has to be. And this film, if you haven't seen Psycho Goreman, do it yesterday. Yeah, go get it. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, the fun. more I watch it, I mean, I went in just wanting a fun, shut my brain off movie. Throwback to the 80s, uh, love of monster effects, conventional effects. Uh, the guy that did The Void, uh, I think his name's Sestansky. I can't remember his first name. Uh, it's, I'm drawing a blank, but he did The Void. Uh, 
he created a whole universe in the world just with like conventional latex and effects. He built this whole universe and made this movie, and it's amazing. And, and I mean, just from that standpoint alone, it's amazing to me, but it's one of the funnest times I've had watching a movie this year. Yeah. And it's all been said and done before, and it's just so off the wall and goofy and quirky and but, yeah. performances. Uh, I was going to say, this little girl in it is makes the movie, too. I mean, she's just a hoot. She's yeah, so like, like, you know, I, I think she rivals Cycle Gorman sometimes. Yeah, yeah, so. for real. So, I mean, if you want fun, uh, you got to check we'll it show out. Show them what they can get. Well, you can't get, get it anymore. because there was only 2,000 made and they're all sold out. So, I don't really want to be a dick and rub it in your face, folks. But, but he's going to. I'm going to anyway. He does so. that. Here is the super hunky boy edition of Psycho Ooh. Gorman. It came straight from Canada. Inside... I will show you if I could get it. God damn it. <laughs> I, I should have had a... Should have waiting. Inside is, if you've ever seen the movie um, House Guest with Phil Hartman and Sinbad, they have a nice mock cover of that, which I think is hysterical. Mm -hmm. uh, inside, I'm not going to open it up for you, but you have uh, trading cards. The original CD soundtrack, which is really cool. Uh, you, you got two discs. You got endless commentaries. In fact, there's a bunch of little Easter eggs I've figured out on there, too. I'm not going to tell you about them, but if you do have to relate to the main screen, if you mess around with that, you can find them. Uh, super cool. And the best part about it is, in the movie, they go to a real place called Lester D's. And uh, <laughs> these little bad boys come with them, too. Glasses you got help you. Help glasses you from, uh, thank you, my beautiful assistant next to <laughs> Yeah, and That's if you actually go to the real Lester D's, they sell these. Mm -hmm. Or, if you was lucky enough to get the uh, Honky Boy edition, uh, you could get these too from Plastic Meatball. So, I don't <laughs> know if they still, you can still get these singly. You might be able to still. But uh, Plastic Meatball, I'd like to give them a, a little plug here. Because I super love this. Uh Pretty like cool again, stuff. pretty cool stuff. The last thing I really want to talk about here is uh, we got this as a gift, and I wanted to kind of show people because I think it's really kind of cool. If you're a horror fan like me, horror trivial pursuit. Mm hmm. And uh, check it out. I know better than to even play with him, so I just opened it up and started asking him questions on the cards. And I think out of what 20 questions, you might have missed one. So I'm like, yeah, I'm not even going to play this with you. It's for decoration. <laughs> <laughs> And last but not least, uh, I want to give a major plug, uh, a good friend of mine. You probably know him if you're in the punk and ska community. His name is Duck. Actually, his real name is Paul Tucker. <laughs> good friend of balls, good friend of ours. He's a real cool cat. Uh, he is also the, you know, the, the lead singer of a little ska punk band called Joystick that I've liked for quite some time. Been on the show before. He's going to be coming on talking about the new record here in the next few weeks. You'll get to check out him then. But new album came out, I Can't Take It Anymore, by Joystick. Check it out. One of my favorite ska punk albums of the year. Pretty if you go enough. to Bad Time Records right mm -hmm. now, you can get the special. I think some of them are sold out, but they might have some left for pre-order. You can get the new album, and I believe if you pre-order it now, that's going to come in early June. They were having some mm -hmm. issues trying to get them printed out. Hmm. Uh, but... Definitely grab one of those. If not, grab a t-shirt, a CD. Support my buddies at Joystick out because they've been working their ass off for the past two years and they made an incredible, incredible ska punk album. Oh, yes. X-Tina, do you have anything else before we close here? Well, um, uh, you know, I have uh, my Depravity Corner. Do you know what I, that is? Depravity Corner? Why? Why? I, it's been so long I can't remember. Would you maybe <laughs> let me and the audience memory. know what it is? Refresh my memory. So, X-Tina here is a little obsessed with true crime and balls, not so much. So, we came to the conclusion that I needed my end segment on the show to discuss true crime. And people seem to love it. They do. Um, you know, so... Now, today, I'm not going to get too crazy and, and get into some long, drawn-out story. Because today... We had big, 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 big breaking news in the world and I'm so excited to share with you and I was hoping this would happen before we recorded. 
You might have heard of George Floyd, maybe, perhaps. I don't know. Never heard of him. Never heard of him? Yeah. Of course I've heard I of him. I highly doubt that, me? right? You'd two have to be living that, in a cave to not know Two who things that, that happened in 2020. We found out. We got coronavirus mm -hmm. and we have blatant racism. <laughs> yeah. This is what we found in 2020. And that all was because of uh, the unfortunate death of George Floyd, who was murdered. Let me repeat that. Murdered oh. by... Police officer Derek Chauvin, I believe is how you pronounce his name. Um, if you don't know, uh, this happened in Minnesota, Minneapolis. Um, he, Mr. Mr. Chauvin, uh, kneeled on George Floyd's neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds. And while this man could not breathe, and all because he was arresting him for a fake $20 bill. Um, Look, uh, you know, yeah, is it wrong to be doing criminal acts? Sure, but uh, do you deserve to die because of it? Nah. Did you ever notice how many people, you know, commit mass murders and, well, they don't die unless they kill themselves, uh, but they're not killed by cops, funny enough, huh? So, with that said, we did have a trial, and um, today the verdict was reached and he was found guilty on three charges second degree murder third degree murder and manslaughter so he will be going to jail now sentencing has not began what i know about true crime and uh since we're recording this i want to see how how accurate i am because it's not a uh, first degree murder charge it is second third and manslaughter i'm gonna go out on a limb and say that if we're lucky if we're lucky he might get sentenced to 20 years, tops. He's not going to get life in prison. And he'll probably get out in 10. There's my prediction. But, I mean, he'll never be a cop again. And, I mean, honestly, this guy should thank his lucky stars that he's going to freaking prison because he would, ha he would have a massive amount of people out trying to kill him, for sure. So, you know, you can say what you want. I mean, you know, but... This was absolutely justice, and there's just no ands, ifs, or buts about it. And police brutality needs to end now. Um, you know, I support the police. I think, you know, overall, the police are pretty great, you know, but there's shitty cops. There's shitty humans everywhere. You know, it doesn't matter what you do, what color you are, what whatever. There's shitty people everywhere. But no man no black man black woman needs to die because of the color of their skin from a cop or anybody for that matter but you know that's where it's frustrating in life and that's where you know, it's 2021 people you know we're watching this bullshit from the 50s and i mean at least you know that was all scary and new to people then i get it but like this this is bullshit so it's time to stop Thankfully, we have justice for George and, you know, things are going to go forward, but, you know, they got to get better. You got to, you got to get better. You got to speak up. If you see something crazy going on, please speak up, say something. You can call the cops on the cops. That's one thing we learned from this trial. Um, you know, I, I watched a few little blurbs of it and there was a woman, she was uh, a 911 operator. And she was, you know, on a call and she had had a, I guess, a video surveillance she could see. And, you know, I guess so many minutes into the call, she actually got off of her, I forget who she was on with, you know, a spectator on the street, I guess. And she got on another line and called the supervisor, something she's never really had to do. And, um, you know, reported them. They had other spectators on the street that... You know, this young black kid got on the stand and he's like, yeah, I called the cops on the cops because <laughs> this was bullshit and it was happening in front of my face. And so, yeah, I mean, you can do that. It's not unheard of. And, you know, thankfully we see that now. And so maybe now people won't be as scared to, you know, report some fucked up shit that might be happening right in front of your face. So just keep that in mind. See something, say something. Justice for George. Yay. You got anything to add? I really do, and I'm going to try to keep it very brief because I know we have our interview with Shuli coming up. All I'm going to say is I think the best and worst thing that has happened from the pandemic is <laughs> you've got to see people for exactly who they are. <sighs> Things like this has happened. 
things like this has made me grow as a person mm -hmm. and, you know, reevaluate everything. Yep. And, I, you know, I've come to the conclusion that, man, it's just this, you can't just sit by on your laurels and just hope everything gets better. Right. I had always thought that we were at a place where, you know, things weren't this bad. We were kind of going in the right direction and things were mm -hmm. kind of becoming better. And, and this has just showed us that pretty much we're, we might as well be back in the 1930s. For real. And, and yeah. I've seen so many people at their at their worst yeah. and, and and then you hear things like uh oh well george floyd was a criminal or he was this or that this trial this whole situation that has no merit whatsoever at all that doesn't even yeah. pertain to anything about what this is about so i mean mm -hmm. you could try to discredit the guy whatsoever that is not the issue right. the issue is you shouldn't be in trouble with the police for something very minimal and end up dying from it. Exactly. That's, I don't give a fuck if you're white, black, purple, plaid, anything. But the point is, it does happen. That and I Ironically, mean, way more often, if not all I, the time. I, I, I mean, and I mean, there's minorities. been, you know, there's been racial profiling and targeting towards African Americans for, for centuries. Years. Yeah. Centuries. So uh, I, I consider today a victory. Absolutely. I've grown myself yeah, so it's much. Bigger. This is bigger than George Floyd. It really this is. is. I mean, is if, if anything that has happened through this, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's made me wake up a lot and it's made me think about things a lot and change me. So if there was any good to come out of it, at least hopefully it did a the same people, for a lot of people. A lot of people so. have, have done a lot more. Uh, learning and growing, as they say these days, you know. But it's true, we have, and, and it's been beneficial and great, I think, for the community, for the world, you know. So, I mean, is this so much what people want to hear right now? No, I'm not doing dumb shit on TikTok. I'm not shooting sprinkler, you right. know, sparklers out of my dick hole to get yeah. a million views or right. doing dumb jackass-type pranks to get people to watch. Not us. All we got, man, is the truth. The truth. So, <laughs> Yep. And, uh, you know, sometimes if it makes you laugh, that's great. And if sometimes it makes you think that's great. And if even one person watches us and enjoys it, it's worth all the fucking aggravation and mm -hmm. heart and soul and blood and everything we put in to make this show for you cats. So hopefully somebody finds it out there and digs what we're about. Absolutely. And that's all it's worth for me. So, I mean, I, if we never got big and we never got a million views, it's, it doesn't mean a fucking no, thing to me. Right. If just that one person, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. got something out of it and enjoys us watching every week, yep. I'll continue to go on. So till then, you know, so sometimes it gets discouraging, man, because it seems like people that do really dumb shit right. and, okay. and, and, and like stuff that like, you know, any, you know, like you'd have to have two brain cells to enjoy, yeah. you know, gazillion views. Mm -hmm. Anybody has something to say, anything better for society, mm -hmm. you know, fuck yeah. you guys. Yeah. So. Yeah. Whatever. That's the world we're living in. Who has something good to say? Who has something good to say? Surely. Surely. That is true. So, cats. Uh, speaking of funny, uh, <laughs> you know, I hope you guys love this. It was a long time coming. Uh, this was actually supposed to happen last March. Mm -hmm. But funny enough, uh, he actually wasn't allowed to do it when he was working with the Stern Show. Now I could actually talk about it. And uh, they had a meeting. Uh, and I'm like thinking, this is, blows my mind, man. They're having a meeting about if he could do my shitty podcast, The Balls from Owen Show, <laughs> at the Howard Stern Show. So yes, that alone right? was worth, that me was pretty fucking amazing. So right, right. That blew, you know, that kind of blew my mind. So I've made just, it. just thinking about <laughs> that. Came up in the I'm like, Stern I can't the picture them sitting there having a meeting like, hey, can surely like be on this this asshole's podcast? Right. That right there, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. So anyway, but a long time coming. Here it is The Man, The Myth, The Legend. Surely a guard. So, hope you cats enjoy it. We'll see you next week. And uh, might have another Stern related guest. You never hmm, know. Perhaps. Hmm. I'll just leave you wondering. So, till next time, next uh, X Tina. All right. Peace. Peace. Peace and love. Hey now, cats. I'm back again this week with the Balls from Elwood show. And with me is a very special guest to the show. If you're a fan, much like Balls is, you'll definitely recognize this cat. He's an amazing stand-up comedian. He's a producer, a writer, not to mention various spots on shows like Jay Thomas, Harry Fish. He was on the Howard 100 News and on the greatest radio show in history. Now you know him as the host of his own show, The Shuley Show. 
the man, the myth, the motherfucking legend. Please welcome Jolie Agar. <laughs> How you doing, brother? I'm so I'm good, balls. Yeah. Thank you, pal. Thanks for having me. Uh, just when I thought your voice couldn't get more annoying, you put some weird announcer uh, touch to it, and you <laughs> proved me wrong yet again. But thank you, pal. It's good to see you. I'm always willing to go above and beyond. <laughs> you're, the, you're the man. I got to tell you, man, uh, as I was saying, uh, you got the show going on. It's fucking incredible, man. I, I, I've been I've been loving it every week. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about... All kinds of shit. So I'm going to get right into it. You know, I've been a fan of yours for years. Uh, and everybody kind of knows, I would imagine, knows about your early days if you were a fan. And uh, But can you give my audience a little brief education as to where you grew up and what it was like? I find you very interesting, sir. You have a really interesting origin story, much like Spider-Man. But uh, can you tell them a little about that? And I want to know, were you a class clown growing up? Because most comedians, I mean, uh, they were, right? Yeah, I mean, it kept me from getting my ass kicked was making people laugh because you know i came in to these schools with a weird name and i was from israel and that was weird and so back in those days you know people called you out on that shit um you know there was nobody coming to your aid to be like you're shaming this part there was none of that shit going there on. was no anti-bullying campaign back then <laughs> no it was a line of people ready to call me you know whatever they could think of um and and so a way to diffuse that was telling jokes and making people laugh. And, and uh, yeah, I would say it wasn't a class clown to the point where I was like showing off in front of the entire school. It was just more around my friends and, and the people I hung out with. I always tried to, I was, I've always been uh, intrigued with uh, how each person has a different laugh. That's uh, ever since I was a little kid, I've always, when I met somebody new, I'd be like, my first thought would be like, what does what their laugh sound like? So my first mission would be to get a laugh out of them. Um, and, uh, and, it, and you know, I've been intrigued by that. I'm intrigued by the fact that, you know, you look like me if I just decided to let everything go. Um, you know, I've actually had people tell me that before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, it's the scary. Worst part, I either get you or I get, like, high-pitched and, like, oh, God, man. <laughs> like, yeah, I, this is like... Uh, I'm really going to start like, not liking pizza so much, I think. <laughs> I know, this is like Looper, but a horror movie version of it. Um, but no, I, I, I grew up uh, pretty much a solo act. My folks were... My dad worked seven days a week. My mom pretty much, you know, tapped out of being a parent. And my brothers hung out with me, but they were both older. And so most of the time I was just on my own. And uh, and comedy was always something that I that I loved watching and and always dreamt of doing one day and being on the balls from Elwood show. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's the pinnacle of your career, sir. <laughs> but, but so hey, there's been there's been lower moments, believe it or not. You're, I don't you're believe not rock that at all, man. I think oh, this yeah. is the this is the fucking floor mat right here, man. So. Oh no, oh no! I did a podcast uh, with a homeless guy on the corner uh, about two hours ago. It, oh, wow. it reaches no one. It gets zero downloads, and I did that because I'm hey, starting. Man. Four people's gonna see this, so I, I feel I feel. No, so. Well, let's <laughs> Let get back to what then. your audience wants to hear. Go ahead. <laughs> Let me ask you this, man: At what age did you have that definitive moment that you knew that your life was going to be dedicated to career in comedy? Did you have like that 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 you know that that moment where you're like, "Holy shit, this is what I want to do forever." It was, but it was after I started doing comedy. When when I started in Vegas, it wasn't going very well. There weren't comedy club audiences they were people who were at the casino that got free tickets to come to a comedy show so the odds were stacked against you as far as like these people have nothing invested into the show so why would they laugh they they're they're there for free so they're going to sit back and be you know super judgmental of whoever's up there and not really give a shit so um for me that moment was about a year maybe two years into doing stand-up a uh, guy in Vegas headliner that uh, kind of took me on the road with him, uh, Joe Lowers. Uh, he comes to me one day and he goes, uh, hey, I'm, I'm going to L.A. tonight. I'm going to camp out to audition for Last Comic Standing 2, I believe it was. And he says, do you want to come with me? And I'm like, yeah, let's go. And we grab clothes, sleeping bags, and we drive out to L.A. 
And we get to L.A., it's about 2, 3 in the morning. We find a spot in line. And then we camp out all night. You know, I'm hanging there getting stoned with other comics. And everybody's, so, you know, it's like a festival type feel. But it's just a bunch of us camping out on a street where, you know, people have houses and people are pissing in lawns and, you know, comics. It's like Woodstock. Um, and then the morning hits and the auditions start. And I remember the guy in front of me when we were inside waiting to go in, the guy in front of me was in an all white suit, like uh, fantasy Island, you know, <laughs> Ricardo Montalban. And he had a wooden, you know, fake wooden parrot on his shoulder. And I'm, and I'm looking at it and I'm going, well, this guy doesn't have a fucking chance in hell. Like this is, this guy's a joke. And he goes into audition after about a minute and a half, two minutes, I hear him, you know, next. And I walk in and when I walk in, he's he's on his way out and I hear the producers go, we'll see you later tonight. And uh, and that's when it hit me. I'm like, oh, they're not looking for comics. They're looking for weirdos. This is the <laughs> this is the gag reel, you know, no like everything came to me. I'm like the comics that are going to be on the show. all have managers, agents. They're all. They're booked. They're not standing in a fucking line in a sleeping bag <laughs> waiting to audition. But I'm there. So I start my audition and and uh, and the, one of the producers cuts me off like 15 seconds into it. And he goes, uh, what's your outfit about? And I said, I'm sorry. And he goes, do you dress up when you perform? And I said, well, sure. Yeah. He says, well, what's this outfit about? I said, this outfit's about sitting in a sleeping bag on a sidewalk for uh, 12 hours waiting to audition. And then he says, okay, continue. And I start again. And the other producer cuts me off and says, um, who are some of your favorite comics growing up? And I said, uh, do you want me to tell you what they were wearing when I saw them? And, uh, and that's, and that's when the first producer was like, thank you. Next. <laughs> and, <laughs> And I walked out, and right when I walked outside that door and I was back outside, I remember, you know, it hitting me like a back truck. Like, there's nothing else I would have camped out on a sidewalk for in a sleeping bag in in life other than stand-up. So I wasn't bitter. I wasn't upset. I didn't feel like what a waste of time. For me, it was that moment where I was like, oh, yeah, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life because there's nothing else that I would – I would do this for. How long did it take you to learn things as a comedian, such as like comedic timing, how to write a joke, all that? How long does that take? There's never, it's, I guess it's like, I've never done therapy, but I, I would say it's a lot like therapy. You're never really done. You're never mm -hmm. really done learning as a comic. I mean, learning how to write for yourself and, and how you're going to write. That's, that's always evolving. Um, and and just picking up stuff along the way the the bad sh you learn more from the bad shows than the good shows the good shows is kind of like cruise control uh but the bad shows is where you really learn about yourself it's where you earn your stripes as a comic it's it's everything the bad shows are more important than the good shows i, I feel like let me ask you this do you ever feel like a joke is completely done i know i've heard a lot of people talk and Sometimes they think like, you know, they could constantly, they constantly evolve. They constantly rewrite jokes. Uh, he's so subjective, like, well, it might kill somewhere, might not get a laugh anywhere else. Do you as a comic uh, think that there's something that's just universal funny or is there, is, is there ever a joke that you could think of that you think is everything's done? Like, is there ever anything that's haunted you where you're like, this is never done. I got to constantly, it's got to re-evolve. It's got to rewrite. I mean, uh, is that, is that how you think? I think it's how you, you, you look at it. You know, it, it, I feel like thinking, you know, oh my God, this thing is like approaching it as a negative is not the way I look at it. I look at it like, like to me, a joke or a story, for example, I like telling stories on stage and a story is like a sandwich. You got, you got your main ingredients. You got your, your beginning and your end, your bread and your meat. Right. And then, all the little shit in between getting from A to B is like the condiments, right? Yeah. And so you can always fatten up that sandwich. You can always add more shit to it. I, I you know, used to do a bit about um, 
getting stoned and watching the Dis- uh, Cheetah special on the Discovery Channel and and getting so high that the narrator's talking to me and my friends while we're watching it. And and it's like a six, seven minute bit in, in my act, but it started as one line pretty much as like one joke. And, and it just kept adding on and adding on. And that's the beauty of working with your friends and other comics is a lot of times they see things, you're too close to the situation. So you don't see the angle or, or a tag or a punchline that you can add this, add that, like Brewer, you know, I worked with him and I used to do this joke about talking to family in Israel and how they want me to come visit them. And I'll be, and I used to be like, yeah, I'll come with, around the time when shit stops blowing up. You know, that was my joke. And he, and in between the first and second show, he comes to me, he goes, you know, it'd be really great for that show. He goes, uh, if you added sound effects like machine guns and missiles and like, you know, ambulances and, you know, and, uh, and I was like, all right. And I tried it out. The next time I did it, like the joke was like a seven or an eight on a scale one to 10. But after I did what Brewer suggested, it was like a 15 to a 20. Like it's, it's a, it's a crusher. It was my opener for years because it was a great way to, um, feel out the it's kind of like dipping your foot in a pool before you jump in you kind of just feel what that audience is like if they groan and they're like that's unacceptable then you know you got a long fucking night ahead of you but if they laugh because it's funny then you're like okay we got ourselves a good crowd let's go so yeah i don't think a joke's ever finished uh unless you want it to be unless you're fine with it and you're cool with it and that's that's fine you know uh we're not all Chappelle. we can't all do seven hours so (laughs) So, I mean, whatever you're happy with, as long as you're happy with it, that's the most important thing. What's the longest amount of time you spent working on a specific bitter joke? Is there one that still goes on to this day? Mm. You know, for me, it's pretty it's pretty uh, cut and dry. Like, uh, I'll have an idea for something. Um, I'll either have the bit mapped out in my head or I'll write it down. Or I'll just write down the, the premise sometimes and, and go up and try and figure it out on there, uh, on stage. But um, no, I, there's there's never been. Yeah, I can't think of, I can't think of, of a joke that. Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Do you still have nervousness when you get on stage? Or does that go away every time? I don't know that it's nerves. It's anticipation. It's like now, you know, you go through the stages of comedy where you start hosting and then you go feature and then you go and headline. And, you know, when you're headlining now, you have to sit through a host. You have to sit through a feature, sometimes two, sometimes three comics. And that that is the feeling I get before if it's a big show yeah i get i still you know i'll still get nerves if it's a i work with howie mandel it's like eight thousand people that was you know i had nerves for that um anything you're doing like a first time experience i did the metallica orion festival i think it was like ten thousand people under a tent and i literally had to pull my buddy uh james matter and who we started together in Vegas and and here, this was black back in the block party days. We were in Atlantic city. We just sold 1200 seats at Harrah's. And then the next day I was doing Metallica Orion fest uh, going on before Brewer after, you know, and then Richard's band was going on. So it was like, we were all there. It was all this family. Everybody's having a great time. I walk into the tent and I see this fucking sea of people that I can't see the end of. And instantly my heart starts beating out of my chest and I start getting clammy. And I'm like, I feel like I'm, I'm doing stand up for the first time again, you know, all the confidence leaves. And uh, I pull my friend James aside and I said, uh, I can do this, right? I, I can do this. And he goes, what are you talking about? He's like, you're going to be great. You're going to be great. And, uh, and I went up there. Cause there's, I see there's like kids in the front with their parents. I'm like, I don't have kids material, but like, <laughs> I didn't fucking tell them to bring kids. You brought them like, that's on you, you know? 
uh, I'm just going to do me. And I went up there and the first thing I did was I asked him if I could take a picture of the crowd and send it to my guidance counselor and tell her to go fuck herself. And <laughs> everybody was like, yeah. yeah. And I had this killer picture uh, of them. And, and my buddy took a picture of me on stage from behind in front of all these people. I got framed at home. and It, it was such a great memory. It was such a great experience. Um, you know, the big shows, you get nervous, but the anticipation is like, once the show starts, I'm like, I want to get, especially if I got something new I'm working on, or I want to try, you know, it's exciting when, when you try something new and it hits and you're like, now we can build, we got the foundation. Now we can build on it. Let me ask you this. Is it, is stand up uh, with other comedians? Is, is there a rivalry or, I mean, it seems like it'd be competitive or people looking to help you or people looking to kind of, is it every man for themselves? I think early on it's, it's, I think I think early on it's pretty cutthroat. Uh, it also depends where you're doing stand up. The bigger circuits, the bigger cities, the more, I guess, competition. But I think New York, um, New York is not like L.A. I think L.A. is much more competitive and like I think some more dirty shits going down in L.A. than New York. New New York is, I think it's just about if you're funny, if you're funny you're respected and, and they, you know, everybody it's, it's more of a fraternity there, I think in New York than in LA, in my opinion. So I, I don't have, I feel like if you, if you were focused on, and this is across the board in life, if you're focused on what other people are getting and why you're not, you're the reason why you're not getting it. The fact that you're sitting there focused on that shit uh, is why it's not happening for you. Take it from me. You know, I know from, from, example that uh when i always sat and said how come how come how come it never happened but the minute i stopped thinking like that everything changed so you know it's tough not to be uh ugly and and like you know uh, competitive when you're starting out in comedy because that's all you're surrounded with and it's just a matter of if that's how if that's how you want to go down this road there are a lot of angry bitter comics but They've also been playing the same gigs for 12 years. They're kind of in quicksand, you know? So uh, I, it's tough, man. Try and be positive in this thing. Try and be supportive. I was sitting there last night, um, you know, hanging out with Pete Corielli and Vlad, and we're backstage at Pete's show. And, you know, we, I haven't been able to hang with comedians in a green room in over a year. And it felt amazing and it was so awesome and, and we're making each other laugh and we're telling stories. And it's like, this is why I started, this is why I wanted to do this is to work with my friends. That's it. I've heard a lot of comedians are damaged people or troubled in some way. Do you think there's validity to this? And why do you think that's so? The good ones are, the good ones are definitely, I always say we're like, uh, there's no difference between a comic and a blues musician, except for the fact that we don't play instruments, <laughs> but we're both the, the, the audience, the audience can feed off that pain. People want to know that you're dumb like they are, or you've made mistakes like they've made, or you piss off your wife like they do. Though That's why that stuff is so, it always works because it brings people into the fold. It brings people into uh, feeling like, oh, I'm not the only one who pretends not to hear my wife when she tells me to do something or whatever the fuck it is, you know? So, uh, yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I forgot where I was going with it, but I'll just keep hitting this. Go ahead. <laughs> you talked earlier about Metallica and uh, it was mm. one of the best experiences in your comedy career, can you share with me one of the worst experiences? Um, yeah, there's quite a few. There's, you know. What stands out in your mind as being the absolute worst? I had a private gig. A guy reached out to me to do a private gig, a uh, Jewish guy. And he offered me really good money. And and uh, he, he didn't really specify what he needed. He just like, would you do stand-up at my home? for X amount of dollars. And mm. when I saw the amount, I said, yes. And then as the gig got closer, more and more things started coming up. Like he sent me an email and he's like, um, Hey, do you, can you do clean material? And I said, uh, 
you know, I, I, I needed the money. I'm like, yeah, I can do clean. He goes, good. There are going to be some kids there. So, uh, is it cool? You got 45 minutes worth of clean. And I'm like, in my head, I know I barely have five minutes. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I said, I, I got 45 minutes. No problem. So then, you know, a few more days go by, sends me an email. Hey, my uncle's coming. He just, uh, beat cancer. Um, and, uh, this person's coming, they're going in for chemo. Oh, uh, he goes, there's going to be a rabbi there. And I'm going, how do I get out of this fucking nightmare now? Right. But again, I needed the money. So I'm pot committed at this point. I go to the gig. I walk in, it's in this guy's house, in his living room. And he says to me, uh, do you want to drink? And I said, no, I'm good. And he says, uh, okay, you're going to go on after the rabbi. And I said, you know what? I'll take the drink now. That'd be great. <laughs> and um, and I had maybe five minutes of material. And I just said, you know what? I'll edit on the fly in, while, I'm, while I'm up there. And I go up and, uh, and my opening line is I go, hey, everybody, it's great to be here. I'm just hoping to get a few more laughs than the rabbi did tonight. And just <laughs> nothing, nothing. <laughs> And so then we begin and I start and I and I'm bomb, bomb and bomb. I'm trying to do crowd work. Nothing's working. I'm, I'm, there's this 13 year old kid who's on his on his fucking switch or something the whole time I'm I'm up there. At one point, I tell a joke, it gets less than nothing. And I'll never forget because I heard it. The kid doesn't even pick his head up. He just goes. <sighs> like <that. laughs> and. I proceed to eat a shit sandwich for about 40 minutes. I think I ran short about five and I thanked everybody. I said good night and I go outside and smoke a cigarette and, you know, try and numb this pain. And the guy comes out who booked me, gave me an extra 500 bucks for like a holy shit tax. Like, I can't oh, believe wow. what I just saw. <laughs> and, uh, and the family came out and thanked me. And I was like, yeah, I don't know what you're thanking me for, but you're welcome. But that that was probably one of the worst gigs I've ever done. There was a backyard gig I did once in Jersey. And um, I was I was standing in a sandbox with the monkey bars and swing behind me. And my spotlight was uh, was an outdoor sensor light that would go <laughs> off periodically. And I needed a this tall dude in the back to just wave his arm and to trigger the light to go back on. So those, <laughs> those are just a few. Oh man. You know, Vegas was a nightmare too. I played a youth hostile hostel once where I was the opener for a magician. Magician was like 70 years old and, and he's asleep in the front row while I'm finishing <laughs> up my set. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to embarrass him by, by drawing, you know, attention from the audience. And by audience, I mean four Swedish tourists that didn't speak a word of English. I didn't want to let them know that their headliner was asleep. So I just, uh, I just got real, I got real quiet in the room and I just go, coming up to the stage right now. And I screamed it and he woke up startled and that's how, that's how I got him on. Hey, hey man, are people ever guarded around you because they're afraid that you'll talk about him in your act? Mm. Uh, no, not really. My, you know, my kids are in my act. My wife's in my act. Um, both will feed me stuff knowingly, sometimes <laughs> unknowingly. Um, and then there's people that you meet, you know, throughout the day, your neighbors, they're, they're always feeding me shit. They just don't know it. But that's, <laughs> that's our job is to, to observe and, and see all this shit, this weirdness. Hold a reflective mirror up to all the weirdos. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for some reason, I, I happen to have a, uh, a a thing, a magnetism with weirdness. <laughs> it seems to, like my wife says, like a moth to a flame. They they come to you. <laughs> it's just a blessing. <laughs> mm -hmm. What did you learn from working on a Stern show that's helped you do your show now? Was there anything? I learned that I can do it. I learned, you know, that was the biggest thing I learned that I'm capable of, of doing this um, on my own and and that I've learned from uh, three of the greatest people to ever do radio, in my opinion, uh, Howard, Jay Thomas, Scott Farrell. Each one of these guys are masters in in their craft 
they all do it differently. Mm-hmm. They're all original. They're, nobody can duplicate what these guys did. And, and I had the, the, the blessing to work with all three of these guys. And I, and I, and that's what this show really is. It, you know, it took me a minute to figure it out, but this is my thank you to all of them. My tribute to working with all of them and all the stuff that I learned because None of these guys had to give me airtime. None of these guys, you know, I didn't have pictures of anybody. I, I didn't, you know, it, they all believed in me to a point to give me a chance. And that that says everything about them, you know, regardless of, of what message boards say and, and bitter people who used to be there and this and that. At the end of the day, they gave me an opportunity. And once I was in there, thanks to Howard, Jay, gave me an opportunity scott gave me an opportunity and these guys you know their belief in me is what kept me going and learning in this and loving this and i just think i got to a point where much like stand up one day i said you know i gotta try this i would rather fail and know that i tried than to sit there and go man what if i would have tried that shit you know so uh, it was a scary jump. It was a scary move, but I felt like everything happens for a reason when it's supposed to, and it felt right. So the thing I learned the most is, is believing in myself is being confident in my abilities and, and, and yeah, realizing that like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good at this and I can do this. And I want to like stand up. I want to learn every day more and more how to be better at it. Um, and, and we're getting there, man. Absolutely, man. I mean, you had to have patience of steel dealing with some of the people on that show, though. Uh, was there ever a time where somebody actually got to you so bad where you thought, like, man, enough of this shit. I can't do it anymore. Did that ever happen? Yeah. Oh, yeah. His name is Bob Levy. Uh, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he'll agree with me. No, he, he's um, – no, it's, it's tough. You got it to – I feel like to get what I got from the whack pack, I had to give as much as they were giving me. Um, it's why I got the stories and the, and the, the, the thoughts um, and the content from them is because, you know, there, there was no clocking out. There was no off time. Um, I had to be a part of their lives to understand their lives, to be able to report on their lives. And they had to, and they, I had to let them into my life so they wouldn't feel like, Hey, this guy's just fucking using me, you know, for info and trying to make me look bad. Um, you know, I'm a comic. My job is to, is to make things funny. Uh, I love and respect the whack pack. They, they gave me 15 years of the greatest job of my life. So I would never knowingly, you know, uh, go out of my way to hurt one of them. I feel just the opposite. I feel like the ones I built a, a relationship with, it's a strong one. It continues to this day. Like I said, there's no clocking out. So I still talk to a lot of them and, uh, and I love it. They're family. Let's focus a little more on your show now, man. I mean, uh, you can hear it on Patreon. I'm, I'm, I'm part of your Patreon. Uh, and then what is it a couple of days later on YouTube? Yeah, I think we do live Tuesdays, and then we release it Friday, the audio and video. And then Mondays now, we're going to be releasing bonus episodes, which uh, for the most part are interviews, uh, about hour-long interviews with um, comics, celebrities, uh, friends of the show. It, it varies, you know, old old Stern staff, serious pals. I did a Howard 100 News reunion thing with that was awesome. Steve. Yeah, it was great. Steve Langford, Lieberman, High Pitch Mike. Uh, I'm going to record, you know, when I get back to off the road, uh, I, I want to do a thing with the Howard TV guys, do a little reunion show there, and then just go back and forth from, like, celebrities and, and pals. And so it's not just, uh, you know, the same thing every week. And I think eventually soon we're going to be doing more than just Tuesdays as far as the podcast goes, the nice. live show. and. Yeah, and we got uh, Miserable Men coming back, Ooh, which is great. that's nice too, man. I was going to say, yeah. you got you got some sponsors now. You're all at Heard At? That- yeah, Heard At Media approached me about three episodes into the podcast and uh, pitched me, basically said, hey, man, we want to work with you. We 
We have a sales team. We got a PR team. Uh, we believe in the show. We believe in you. And what's great about them is much like me, they're, they're, you know, they're not a huge company. They're not, I'm not a huge name, but they're hungry and they understand, uh, like that they understand to get behind the talent. They, they, they're not in the, they're not in the business saying no. And towards the end of my run, uh, at Sirius, you know, I felt like that was all management's job was to say no to some stuff that a lot of stuff that, that the writers pitched and, and wanted to do. And so with them, they are the complete opposite. They're super supportive. Whatever I, I think of, they, they are like, we'll make it happen. Uh, equipment wise, the podcast sounds great now because of them, um, everything that, uh, that they said they would come through on, they have the show. Our numbers are better than ever. And uh, our guests, I mean, I'm going to be in LA this week uh, for 420. I'm doing a podcast uh, that day. I'm doing a couple podcasts when I get out there, but I'm doing my show live from LA on 420. And I mean, dreams are coming true. I'm in LA legal state on 420 doing my own show. I don't know what the fuck's going to happen. I don't know how crazy it's going to get. I don't know what I'm going to remember from it, but (laughs) I'm excited to do it. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's great, man. There's a lot of fun things on the horizon with the show. And uh, yeah, I love her that man. Have uh, have anybody has anybody refused to be a guest on your show that you've had so far? Because I've had some funny uh, refusals in the past, and I wondered if you came across any so far. Absolutely not. I mean, there's there's people that you know um, that I've known for years, uh, big you know bigger names in the business. For example, like Howie Mandel, I, mm-hmm. I texted him. Um, I think it was on a Tuesday. And I said, uh, hey, man, I I left the show. You know, I I have this podcast now. I'd really love for you to be a guest if you have time. If you don't, you want to wait till you got something to promote. I understand. I got a text back in 10 minutes. He says, uh, I'm going to email. I'm going to, you know, have my person email you. We set up an interview the next week. He jumped on. He did the interview, did an hour. It was great. It's coming out Monday. Um, and the list goes on and on of, of people I've reached out to. They're like, absolutely. There's people that don't do interviews that are going to do interviews with me. There's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of cool guests coming up, man. And it's people that I, I dig and respect. I, I got to interview, uh, Johan Hegg, the lead singer of Amana Marth. Um, yeah. Which, yeah, which is just awesome. Like, that's the thing. Like, it's stuff that I'm excited about. You know, it's not going to be a new show. We're not going to discuss fucking politics. I want to get as far away from that. I want the show to be funny. I want the show to be inspiring. I want it, you know, a lot of people emailed me and said, hey, man, I'm I'm in a place where I'm not happy. I'm thinking of changing. Your show's inspired. That's what I love, man, because there were people that I watched, you know, Jim Carrey, Steve Harvey. I'd watch their videos on YouTube telling you you know do this do that and uh and so i love being on the other end of that and i'm going to continue doing that well you've definitely made a frankie mcdonald fan out of me for sure (laughs) (laughs) that dude's awesome (laughs) bulgaria (laughs) what's the difference between doing your show surely as opposed for when you're working for a show is there a big difference yeah i mean it's it's your thing it's like whatever whatever you want to do, you can pretty much do, you know, you, you, I I mean, for me, it's like, um, I'll put it to you this way Uh, on a Sunday. I couldn't enjoy a Sunday because I knew Monday was coming and Mm -hmm. I had to get up early and towards the end, you know, I was getting up and doing something that, that my heart wasn't into. So I, I was, I wasn't happy going into it, which I know some people watch. Like, what the fuck, man? What you can't, how can you not be happy with that? I, I was 15 years. You know, a lot of things change in 15 years. A lot of people change in 15 years. Um, I just, for me, now, every day is a weekend. There's no Sunday where I'm dreading Monday. That's every amazing. day, 
is uh, is exciting. Everything is content now. Uh, you know, the show I did a couple weeks ago and I got back from Florida, you know, it was a big deal to me because I wanted to see if I could recap a weekend on the road for an hour. You know, and I had my notes down of what I wanted to talk about, but I didn't have any jokes or anything prepared. I was just going to kind of bring it up and see what comes out in conversations with ESO, you know, my producer and co-host. And um, and we went over an hour. It was great. And so that for me was a huge confidence builder where I'm like, OK, now I know when I go on the road, I can recap the road and we have enough for an episode. Uh, granted you know, something's going on. If there's nothing there, there's nothing there. But um, like I said, it, much like stand-up, I'm learning uh, each time I do it and the audience is helping me learn. And I think the audience is digging that, that it's kind of like a, 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 we're starting at the ground floor together. We're, we're, we're building this thing together. And, and I love that. You're not only a comedian, but your father to two girls. If your daughters ended up falling in your footsteps and being comedians, would that bother you or would you, would you promote that? I love it. I, I, my 11 year old's uh, deadly funny and she, she definitely will be doing something in comedy for sure. She's right. Writes better jokes than I do uh, at 11. <laughs> so she, yeah. And then my six year old is, you know, She's just going to be whatever the fuck she wants to be. She didn't take no shit from nobody. She's a little fucking Godzilla. And uh, <laughs> I love them. They're both hilarious, man. They both crack me up uh, on the daily, man. But my 11-year-old, she's nasty with it. She is fucking quick. How do you separate between work life and home life? Is it hard to establish that line? And I mean, does your brain constantly think about the next joke or the next guest or this or that? Can you ever just turn that off and be in the moment? Yeah. 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 So especially now it's much easier, you know, working for the show, you're surrounded by people who are giving their all to that show. So you kind of have to either match or you're going to be out. And I get it. When I started there, I gave my all to the show for many, many years. Um, I think the pandemic sticking me at home with my family and reconnecting with them and realizing that, okay, they need to be on the top tier, not work. And, and they need to come first. And so that's when things started changing for me, where I was like, I've been, I've not connected with these people for over a decade because work is every, and it's not, not blaming work for it. It's a decision mm -hmm. I made because I wanted to produce great content. I wanted to be uh, a part of whatever I could and be a team player and show my worth and establish a foothold and be a part of something that I've loved for so many years. Um, so you have to learn how to do that. And the pandemic helped me learn that. And now it's, it's very simple for me. It's, it's about, you know, because now I unplug and spend time with them and whatever we do now can end up there. So it, it doesn't hurt you any, it doesn't hurt me any. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something that I'm enjoy enjoying right now because we're doing it all over again. What's one thing that you like to do that might surprise your fans? Yodel. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> What's something that I like to do? I've been really digging country music lately since I live in uh, Huntsville, that blows my Alabama. Mind, man. I can't even picture you sitting there uh, here. And, and there's some really great <laughs> artists. That, I'm talking like... Yeah, I grew up on Patsy like, Cline and shit like that, man. I love that kind of stuff. My parents were yeah. happy for that growing up. I mean, I... Yeah, no, that's... Country is really good. Mm. Yeah, so that's the kind of... You know, Patsy, that's pretty gay. But um, I think... <laughs> There's guys out there uh, that I that I love to listen to. This guy uh, Tyler Tyler Childers, um, Sturgill Simpson, Coulter Wall, uh, uh, who's the Marcus King? Marcus King Ben. These guys, they're like the songs have to do with mushrooms and coke and weed and, and <laughs> killing and like and they're old school. Coulter Wall is another guy. He sounds just like Johnny Cash. Hmm. Um, but I, yeah, I was at a buddy's house and I heard this song and I'm like, who the fuck is this? And then I started listening to it and, and um, I've really been digging it lately. It's like, uh, and my daughter, my six-year-old, 
she loves it too. So we have like a whole playlist we have at night when I mm. lay her down where it's just all country songs and she loves it. Love hearing her sing. And I'm like, she's she's probably gonna end up in Nashville, this kid. She's big in country, nice. but so am I. I'm loving it. Cool, man. What's the best piece of advice anyone's ever given you? Uh, my dad, I would I would stay up late to watch Carson. Uh, I loved watching Johnny Carson's show, and I would hear him coming down the hallway, and I would run, I would run over the TV, and I turn the volume down. I leave it on like I passed out, you know, watching TV. And I would just close my eyes and I'd lay there and I hear him walk in my room and he would stand by my head. Like this was what I would see, right? This angle. And he would stand there for about 10 to 15 seconds, not saying a word. And then he would crouch down and he'd whisper in my ear in Hebrew, you can't scare a hooker with a dick. <laughs> That's pretty good. And I, <laughs> yeah. And it's a good way to see if your kid's sleeping because I would laugh every time and he would bust me. And that was the end of that. So uh, that that piece of advice. Oh, and one other thing. When I would when I would eat a meal at the house and I would finish, I take the napkin and then I ball it up and I'd shoot it for the garbage can and I'd miss on my way to picking it up. My dad would tell me in Hebrew. A lazy man does everything twice. Yeah, that's pretty good too. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. So I have two kids. <laughs> it worked out though. <laughs> yeah, man. Strangest thing a fan's ever requested of you, surely? Is it this shit? Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I don't know about requests, but the, probably the strangest interaction I had was I think it was in the Frisco. And it was after a show. I think it was a block party show. And uh, I'm in. I'm taking pictures with people, saying hi. And this one guy shaking my hand. And he's like, shalom, bitch. He's like, I'm a huge fan. And I'm like, thanks, dude. And as we're shaking hands and I'm looking at him, I see, like, the top of a swastika tattoo uh. creeping out of his shirt collar on his neck. And I'm like, and he's like, hey, man, take my car. He's like, love you, Shuey. And he walks out. <laughs> And I don't know if I still have it. I may have the card saved at home, but it was like an Aryan clothing line. <laughs> and it was, and it just said tired of diversity on the front and on the back. It said, so are we. And, uh, and that guy left going, Shalom, bitch. Love you, brother. <laughs> Which was the that? weirdest. <laughs> All right, that, that that's, was that's comedy. Comedy yeah. transcends hate, color, gender, sex. Sometimes uh, truth is pronouns. stranger than fiction, huh? <laughs> yeah, all that shit. Is there any topic in comedy that is off limits to you? Uh, not yet. Not yet. I mean, yeah, I don't think so. I mean, it's, it's not. You know, my wife didn't. My wife didn't have a miscarriage, so it's not like I'm doing bits about it. But you know, there there are a lot of comics who that's how they deal with the pain. It's therapeutic on that stage. It's, it's cathartic for us. We're releasing a lot of shit. The funniest stuff is the realest stuff. So, um, you know, a guy like Robert Schimmel who lost the kid to cancer, oh, yeah. uh, he used to do a joke about the make a wish foundation contacting him. And they said, you know, does your son have a wish? And he says, yeah. Um, my son, Last wish is to see Dolly Parton give me a blowjob. And they go, well, we were thinking more along the lines of Disneyland or Six Flags. And he said, yeah, he says she can blow me at Disney or Six Flags just as long as you can walk. <laughs> oh, he was great. It was amazing. And, that, and that's how he chose to deal with it. So, you know, uh, there's a reason why we still know his name right now in comedy because he, he was real. He, he took those chances and did those and did that material. That was his real life. So I, I personally don't think there's anything off limits, but I don't go out there looking. There's a difference between nothing being off limits and then going out there to piss off an audience or like to, you know, there's, it's all in the delivery mechanism. You can talk about anything. It's just how you deliver it. That's, that's it. Well, that leads me to my next question. I mean, does it disgust you that we're living in a day and an age where comedians get fucked with for telling jokes and this this horrible counter cancel culture and all this bullshit? 
I, I feel like comedians can't even tell jokes anymore without even getting fucked with. Like, uh, I mean, how do you, does that affect the way that you write now? Or do you, do you take that in any sort of consideration? Or do you just do your thing and, you know, what happens, happens. I mean, I quote Ric Flair, fire me. I'm already fired. Woo! Woo! <laughs> I'm not, I'm not worried. You know, I don't have anything to be canceled from. I don't have anything to be knocked off of. So I'm not worried personally about someone coming after me and canceling me. Um, but I think that, you know, crowds have always been sensitive. It's not like we were fucking, you know, it's not like they were, uh, you know, the, the crowds are always evolving. It's, um, but I feel like there's going to be a bit of a pendulum swing here because I feel like people have been cooped up with their own thoughts and their own, and the news and the, and the fucking, the hype and the, and these pep rallies that are now called news uh, programs. Um, I think they just want to laugh. I think they want to forget about this shit. I think they want to move on. And I personally feel like the only thing that I don't like talking about on stage is COVID and politics. Like, mm -hmm. I don't give a fuck about either of those things. Um, you know, my family's safe. I'm safe. I have peace of mind now. I'm happy. I'm in a great place. I want to talk about everything else. And and I don't feel like um, this cancel thing is going to be around for long. I feel like the minute you apologize, you're fucked. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so you just got to be careful. And if you listen, man, uh, your timeline, your your WhatsApp, all that shit. I mean, that's like a hair drug test. It goes way back. So, you know, be careful who you're fucking calling out and what you got in your fucking shed that you're hiding. Uh, I, I hate to see people lose their jobs or their livelihoods over anything, whether they're comics or whatever. I just wish more people, you know, everybody's got a voice. That's the biggest problem. Everyone has a voice. Everyone needs to be heard. And people who haven't succeeded in certain industries are now commenting on those industries and, and leading this kind of, you know, villager charge to go after people um, in an industry that they couldn't that they couldn't hang in. And this person's out there just working shit out, riffing, trying to be funny. They're not bad people, but you hear a word or they said, you know, they made a comment about something and now let's go burn their entire building to the ground. And that's just insane. And I think it's going to fucking swamp back into their face. Does being a comic ever interfere with uh, relationships with family, friends? Is it, does it, a, is it more of a detriment uh, than a help? Not really. I, I, you know, if I know there's something that involves my family that could be a joke, but they may not appreciate it, then I just won't do it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if it's something that's really, really good, uh, it doesn't have to be about my family. I can change the people in it mm -hmm. and and just do it that way. But, you know, I'm not looking to alter my act, but I'm also not looking to fucking cause any problems either. You know, my family aren't necessarily calling me up going, hey, you should talk about this. This happened to me today. You know, so I'm kind of just, mining from personal conversations if i do it so you got to be careful how you do it what you do you know back before the whole covid bullshit uh does being on the road for an extended period of time make your sex life better when you get home uh boy i've never been more creeped out um <laughs> Well, sure. I mean, yeah, we definitely miss each other for sure. And uh, it's always nice when you come home with a check, too. That uh, that always helps. <laughs> so, yeah, but it's tough being on the road. I mean, this this appearance is an example of it. This is, uh, you know, this is where I'm at today. I have nothing going on. But I love you. I love you, too. <laughs> <laughs> What's the most bizarre porno you've ever witnessed? The bizarre, most bizarre. I was all right. So I'm in Vegas, and I'm doing uh, shows out there. And I had to get a cab from one hotel to another. And I get in the cab, and the guy goes, uh, "What do you do?" And I go, 
ah, I'm a comic, which I never, well, I normally don't say that, but I, I think I was on my phone. I go, oh, I'm a comic. And he's like, you want to see something? And I'm like, all right. And he pulls up his phone and he doesn't, he doesn't open anything. He doesn't, it's on his phone, ready to go. And he just hits play. And it's a woman, Asian woman tied to like four steaks. And she's got like honey all over her body. <laughs> and then they open this little barn door and about 10 little piglets come out and they <laughs> all start eating honey off of her. And I can't even get into what I'm watching because I'm sitting here the whole time thinking, what gave this guy the impression that this is something I would want to see? What did I say that makes him think this guy's into piglet porn or whatever the <laughs> fuck that was? And I mean, the video was insane. Uh, I look, I see the time. It's like 18 minutes long, which I, I imagine they eat her at some point. Uh, oh, <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know sexually or literally, but I, you know, pigs will eat anything. Um, yeah, 18 minutes is long enough for both. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. We watched it twice. You witnessed the snuff uh, film. <laughs> yeah. Well, I came, and he dropped me <laughs> off. And, yeah, that was weird. Hmm. Yeah. As a comic, what's a surefire way to make you laugh? What do you, what, what can you, what do you find funny? Um, I like, I like, uh, my favorite type of joke, it's something my dad used to do, is he would hold up this hand and he would snap his fingers and then you would look up at it and he'd smack you with this one. Uh, <laughs> those are my those are my favorite types of jokes, the ones where you're for sure you see it going down this way and then pow, out of nowhere, a completely different punchline or what, you know, it just, it's great. Um, I don't remember the comic's name. I think he was a writer for Fallon and he was doing a spot one night at a club in New York that I was doing a spot at. And I will never forget this joke. It was such a great joke. He says, I'm in an interfaith marriage. My wife is, uh, I'm Jewish and my wife is Irish Catholic. He says, the only thing we've ever had in common is when you two put out that free album. <laughs> uh, no, don't laugh. That's fine. Anyways, I thought it was a great joke. Ball <laughs> you know, I mean, what do I know about comedy? <laughs> can you re can you remember your first concert? My first concert? Mm -hmm. MC Hammer, uh, Oaktown three five seven. True. Yeah. All right. Great Western form. That was my first concert by myself. Uh, nice. My very first concert with my brother, uh, the police, Ooh. Irvine, Irvine True Meadows. Too. Oh, yeah. Man. That's where I, I learned about hacky sack and weed. Oh, that leads me to my next question. What is the highest you've ever been? Can you remember? Yeah, when I agreed to do this podcast. <laughs> uh, I don't think you were higher enough. <laughs> uh, I I uh, What's the craziest yeah. thing you ever did on a bet, Julie? Uh, I don't really do bets. Nobody's hmm. ever bet. I don't, yeah, I don't ever. Oh, you know what? I, um, a guy in high school dared me to go on one of the buses taking, uh, kids back home to South Central LA and jump on the uh, speaker system. And, uh, and I did that. I, I ran onto one of the buses and I grabbed the PA and I go, is this heading to Watts? And everybody goes, get the fuck off the bus, asshole. And they just all yelled at me. And I ran off. But uh, the next day, a bunch of people from that bus were like, that shit was funny yesterday, man. So it was good. It's all I needed. It's all I need. One person to laugh. <laughs> well, there you have it, man. Thank you so much for being a guest on my show. I, I, It was a pleasure to have you, sir. I love you. I'll be a fan always. Let's tell everybody where we can see your show again. That's on Patreon, correct? Yes. Well, before that, I want to thank you for being a fan and uh, always being supportive of me. You've come to countless shows. 
you've supported me throughout the years and I appreciate you and I appreciate you being patient with my scheduling and doing this, but I'm glad we can do it and, uh, and, and keep doing it, man. You're good. Thank you so much. Julie. You don't even know how much that means to me, dude. Uh, I, well, I know you paid me $800 to say it. So it obviously means $800. Well, anybody who knows me knows that's not true. <laughs> 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 okay. uh, the no, man, the can, yeah, oh, you please can go check ahead and out. suck my dick a little more. I love this. No, I'm done. That's it. Oh, uh, you can check out. Yeah, you can. That's all you sent me in the script. Anyways, um, <laughs> you can check out. You can check out my podcast. Uh, you can watch it live every Tuesday night. Uh, and there's tons of bonus content on Patreon. Um, also, I have this great little camera now with a tripod, so I'll be taping my sets, and and so I'll be posting some stuff on Patreon there. But a lot of bonus content from my phone for the past 15 years of working. A lot of stuff, man. Yeah, so I'm I'm kind of cleaning out my cloud. Uh, that's on there, as well as um, every uh, Friday gets released everywhere on all audio platforms. The Shuli Show. Patreon is uh, patreoncom slash Shuli Show, and uh, Twitch. I'm on Twitch playing video games. Uh, Shalom Shuli TV on Twitch and Instagram. Twitter, websites, all Shalom Shuli. And uh, yeah, man, thank you, Balls. I appreciate it, buddy. Oh, Thanks and again, Miserable man. Men. Oh, yeah. Miserable Men coming soon. We're coming out hot. The I will I'll definitely I'll throw some plugs up for that so people don't miss that. Uh, the legendary, the man, the myth, the legend, my buddy, Shuli. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you for being on this show. And uh, best of luck to you, man. I'm so happy for you. I couldn't be more happy and proud. Thanks, man. Thanks, balls. Love you, bud. Give you a big fat guy snuggly hug. See you. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Later. See you. Hey, now, cats, make sure you don't forget to go and pick up a ticket for my pals, the Scotch Bonnet's first live stream concert. They are absolutely incredible. If you love Scott, you're going to love these cats. So make sure you go on and get a ticket and don't miss it.